everyone. I think we're ready to start. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you for being so patient. Um, I hope everyone grabbed a plate. The food is really good. I want to thank the Bronx for um, welcoming everyone out of Borough. Um, my name is Femi Desu Oakley. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, for those who don't know me, I worked in Brooklyn um, in CDP for 11 years. So I just want to say hello and thank you so much for coming to our Hispanic Latinx Heritage event this year. When we sent out the invitation for Hispanic Latinx um, Heritage event, a lot of people asked me, well, a lot of people said first, you spelled um, Latino wrong. <laughs> and then, you know, once we said, no, that is, the, that is the term that we're using, people started asking questions, you know, what's Latinx? So I, you know, I did want to let everybody know for, you know, for people who don't know, because I did get a lot of questions, that Latinx is a term that is, the goal is to move beyond the sort of gender binaries, and it's more inclusive for um, a lot of gender identities. It includes people who identify as transgender, queer, gender nonconforming, and gender fluid. So this word is meant to be more inclusive for the Latino and Latina community, and it really includes a lot of um, intersex intersecting identities for um, the La Latin American descendants. So language is evolving, it's ever changing, and Legal Aid Society tries to embrace that um, and move forward with progressive um, movements in language, um, politics, um, in, in all areas. And we really wanted to sort of put that out there and let people know that we are sort of embracing this inclusive language to celebrate this event. So I want to take this time to say thank you, first of all, um, to all of you who came, um, and especially to our speakers who are going to be sharing their stories with us momentarily. I want to welcome Council Member Gibson for coming here, um, her district. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We're very honored for you to be here with us and share with us in this celebration. And we are obviously very proud of the hard work and advocacy that you do for our community and our clients. So thank you so much for being here. I just want to emphasize before I turn it over to Seymour how important this event is now more than ever. You know, we, we celebrate these heritage events every year and you know, Different, different months is a different heritage event. And I think, especially for the Hispanic Latinx community, this is so important and so pivotal at this you know, time uh, in society. I feel like the Legal Aid Society is making a progressive move forward for diversity and inclusion. But unfortunately, the way our landscape is right now, um, it's not co coinciding with that move for inclusiveness. But despite that, despite these struggles and these challenges, we still have to come together and honor and celebrate our culture, even if we are still hearing and seeing this hateful rhetoric that is coming from certain parts of our government. I think um, in this time of just of hate towards, that is specifically targeted towards the Hispanic Latinx community, um, now more than ever, we have to come together um, because it is a crisis. But I believe in crisis. Mm -hmm. That is when we find our strength. That is when we find our resilience. And that's when we find our solidarity to fight together. So I appreciate all of you coming here to show the Hispanic Latinx community, our colleagues, and our clients that um, we will show our strength and our resilience and our solidarity. So I really appreciate everyone coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Femi. Thank you so much for introducing the evening for us. You know, we, we started these events, I guess, about 
10, 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, we went through different phases. We did some at Water Street, uh, and then we were doing them all at Water Street for a while, and then we moved out into the boroughs, and now we, we, we vary it. Uh, but it's really important to recognize and celebrate the contributions uh, of the Latin Latinx community to American society. And it's really appropriate that we celebrate here in the Bronx because the Bronx is a, a county which uh, has more than 50 percent Hispanic Latinx uh, members. Um, some great people from the Bronx have contributed to our society and one of, the, I guess one of the people right now who everyone knows about is Sonia Sotomayor who is a Supreme Court Justice, a descendant of the, of the South Bronx. Um, and we have Councilmember Gibson here who, as Femi said, this is her district. Um, I'm not sure what the demographics are in this district, but I know in the Bronx it's, it's about 54% overall <coughs> in the Bronx, and I, can, I suspect in this district it's, it's maybe even higher. Right, yeah. So we're really pleased that you're able to join us. Um, we're going to hear from some great speakers this evening. They're going to talk about you know, the impact of different events on, on the Latin, Latinx community. Um, I was in the Bronx many years ago. There are a couple of people who might remember. I don't know if any of them are here, but you know, I was probably in the Bronx before many of you were born. Um, some things have changed. Some things haven't. One of the things that hasn't changed is that our clients are still black and brown people, uh, almost exclusively. One thing that has changed is that the composition of this office is significantly different than it was when I was here from 1978 to 1980. At that point, you could count on one hand uh, the number of Hispanic Latinx members. I think there were two or three lawyers. Uh, I think, uh, is, is Joe here? Joe was here. Uh, I guess he left. Um, a, a couple of support staff members and I guess, oh, there you are. One investigator. Um, and we didn't have such nice offices. Uh, we were, uh, I was in the office on Gerard Avenue, which is over the supermarket. And then the other half of the office was in the old Concourse Plaza, which I, right on the corner of uh, the Concourse and 161st Street. And just before I left, or just after I left, we were moving to these brand new digs on the Grand Concourse 1020. <laughs> And I guess you all know what, what became of those. Uh, it it uh, deteriorated significantly during the time that we were there because of the lack of uh, treatment by the landlord. But in, in any event, uh, you're now in a really good space. Uh, the Bronx is changing to some degree, although the Yankees are still a big force here. And when the Yankees are playing a big game, it's hard, it's hard to get around. It's hard to get around. And I, I remember opening days, they used to uh, pretty much shut down the courts in the early afternoon. Oh. Is, does that still happen? No. No? no. Okay, well, yeah. So, all right, but, so anyway, so l let me, l let's start the program. I, I really want to thank, again, uh, Councilmember Gibson for coming. Uh, Councilmember Gimber Gibson is the uh, Councilmember for this district, the 16th district. Um, she is also the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, uh, the first woman and first person of color to head that committee. And she, yeah. and that committee has oversight for the police department, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, she's really been a, a passionate advocate uh, for affordable housing for seniors, for low-income families, um, and criminal justice reform. In fact, she really has been a, a leader in criminal justice reform. She's been a big supporter of anti-violence and anti-gun violence programs. Um, and one of the programs, uh, that program funds our community justice unit. Um, she also uh, was one of the prime movers in establishing 
the right to counsel in, in, in housing court for our clients. Um, so you can see that she not only talks the talk, but she walks the walk. She makes sure that things that need to be done get done. So we're really very grateful for everything that you've done. And she's also a great supporter of the Legal Aid Society. When we go to, to, to seek funding from the council, she's an advocate. Our Prisoners' Rights Project, which had no public funding uh, prior to th about three years ago, um, she was the co-sponsor of, of the legislation which gave our Prisoners Rights Project uh, $750,000 uh, so that we could more effectively represent our clients who were held at Rikers Island. So we thank you very much for that. So, <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Gibson. I can't believe I did all that. Wow. <laughs> And that's just a fraction. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's great to see all of you. It's great to be here. Um, welcome to our beautiful district, the 16th Council District. I'm so honored and always privileged to speak to my family at the Legal Aid Society. And I want to thank you, Seymour, not just for your friendship, for your partnership, but for your incredible service. I won't say how many years, um, but you are truly a seasoned leader that we really need at this time in the public defender world. So I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm thankful for all that you have done in serving not just the residents of this district, but certainly the entire city of New York. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. <laughs> all right. So it's great to be here, and while we talk about the month and the celebration of Hispanic heritage, I'm grateful that we recognize it's not just Hispanic culture, Hispanic heritage, but Latinx. Did I say it right? That's great. I love it because it continues to talk about the evolving, diverse communities that we all serve. And the fact that though we may have different cultures, though we may have different nationalities, but we come together on common ground of priorities, of keeping our children safe, of providing them the quality education that they need. And for so many years, Legal Aid has been at the forefront. It's been an absolute honor to work side by side with many of you as a member of the city council. It's been four years. I remember the day I got elected. I remember the day I resigned as a member of the New York State Assembly. And the next day, I joined the city council. Um, I will never forget that day. And my life has never been the same. It's been such an honor being a part of this city council with a leader and a speaker like Melissa Mark Viverito, who's been a champion of criminal justice reform, of fighting for immigrants, women, children, families, fighting for the LGBT community, just fighting for everyone who oftentimes are labeled as vulnerable or at risk or disadvantaged, and all the other titles that are sometimes associated with our constituents, your clients, and those that you represent. But through it all, in the past four years, we have made incredible progress. Right to counsel was not easy to get done, but three years, we got it done. And a lot of people didn't think we would get it done, but we recognize that too many families face the burden of eviction. They are rent overburdened. And we needed to provide critical resources like free attorneys in housing court so that we could level the playing field for so many of our clients. And I say that because they're my constituents. I represent them in the city council. For so many of them that have been denied opportunities, doors closed in their faces, you give them hope. You give them a fresh start, you give them a second chance, you give them an opportunity to be a productive member of our community. And so I say thank you. It is important that while they give us one month to recognize the incredible contributions of all of our pioneers in the Hispanic community, we celebrate Hispanic leaders every day. And we really should. The unsung heroes and sheroes, the mothers, the women, the educators, the principals, 
all of the leaders that sometimes don't get that recognition and we're grateful for them. So I had my own Hispanic heritage event in our district uh, about a week ago and I had a chance to honor someone who unfortunately uh, lost her life in the line of duty. She was an EMT, Yadira Arroyo, who served for 14 years as a member of EMS Station 26. She's a Shiro. She never envisioned that she would be a Shiro, but when you look at the countless lives that she saved, going into uncharted territories of serving residents that have medical emergencies, and she did that. And so all of us have a real responsibility, a collective responsibility, to make sure that we continue to lift up and build up those next generation of leaders. We owe it to the next generation of young people who are crying out for attention and leadership. So whether it's fighting for tenants rights, for immigrant rights, I'm also proud that Legal Aid has been really leading a really important conversation on gravity knives. And that's something we just talked about on Monday at my public safety hearing, because too many young men and women of color get caught up in possessing gravity knives and they're going to jail and they're getting convicted for something that's legal that's sold at local hardware stores. And so these are the things that our constituents are going through each and every day. And I cannot tell you and emphasize in this climate how important your work is. Um, I've heard some of the stories of clients going to court and unfortunately there's someone waiting for them outside of court, right? It's not NYPD, but it's another local, non-local law enforcement agency. That's what I call it, I don't use that word. But these are, are individuals that are just waiting for our clients to deport them. And so we're fighting as a sanctuary city to make sure that we provide the services, the safety and security that our residents truly need and deserve. The pipeline to prison is real. And Legal Aid has been with us when we have fought to make sure that our children are not arrested and given summons in our schools. Some of them being handcuffed as young as seven years old for disciplinary issues or because they have an IEP or they have a disability. So we have fought the good fight for so much of my time in the city council. And I'm very proud of that. It's not easy chairing this committee. And I appreciate the opportunity that Melissa has given me to serve as the first woman and the first person of color. But while I may be the first, I should not be the last because I want young girls and boys that look like us to see me and see themselves. I want them to recognize that you may have a record, you may have been arrested before or given a summons, you may have sat on Rikers Island for some time, but that shouldn't determine your future. It shouldn't be a part of your character, right? It's something on your record that shouldn't determine your future. But for many of our children, it does. And that's why our work is so critical and why we cannot stop. As long as our children are on that pipeline to prison and not the pipeline to college and jobs and careers, our work is not done. As long as we have a system that looks at our clients differently than it does at others, our work is not done. As long as we have to fight and give tenants, lawyers when they go to court, because for every attorney, and landlord, you have double the attorneys than when you look at tenants, our work is not done. As long as we have a homelessness crisis with 60,000 people that go to a shelter at night, almost two thirds of that being children, our work is not done. So we need you like never before. Yes, I understand we have a man that sits in the White House that does not align with the work that we do, but I don't let that distract me or cause me to lose focus of what is important. Because as a council, as city government, we have a lot of tools and resources at our disposal. And I refuse to let that gentleman stop everything that we have done and all of the progress that we have made. So all of you know we have to fight a little more, we have to advocate a little bit more, but we're used to that, especially for us in the Bronx. 
we sometimes have to fight the good fight because the Bronx has been shortchanged for quite some time. And we're turning things around. Unemployment is going down. The borough president and the elected officials, we are trying our very best to make a difference in this borough. I am grateful for Legal Aid Society. You have been an incredible part of the vision that this city council has set forth. And now in the couple of months that we have left under our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, we're now looking obviously to January and what happens then. So I don't know if I will remain as chair of public safety. Um, there could be changes and shifts that are moved around. But as I have worked for the past four years with the NYPD, the five district attorneys, the criminal justice uh, prosecutor, the CCRB, and the mayor's criminal justice director, we have really led the conversation on cure violence, looking at gun violence from a holistic perspective, and not just deploying more cops in a neighborhood because we need more cops when there's violence, but going into a community and saying, let's give our young people jobs, let's propose more mentoring programs and after school, and everything that we know are the things that our young people need to be productive, right? Changing young people's choices so they don't feel their only option is to engage in violence and to pick up a weapon. But instead of picking up a weapon, they can get a job. So that's what this council's focused on in summer youth, all year round youth employment, the gun violence work we've done, the cure violence work with the New York City crisis management system. We went from five neighborhoods to 18, and now we're expanding two more neighborhoods in the Bronx, in the 4-8 and the 5-2 precincts, and also the work we've done around alternatives to incarceration and detention and the coalition that I've worked with for four years, making sure that we don't just do work reacting to something, but we do preventative work. Not waiting for a young person to get in the system, but preventing them from getting in the system in the first place. It sounds so easy, but yet so difficult to do. And Legal Aid, you have been with us. You have always been the loud voices and the champions that we have needed on criminal justice reform. To me, basic humanity, the prisoner's rights project, so that loved ones who unfortunately find themselves going onto the island, visiting a loved one on Rikers, have a chance to understand the access to benefits and medical services and housing, saving many of our detainees from losing their job, losing their kids. You have been in the trenches, and I thank you for that. So while we recognize Hispanic heritage and Latinx heritage, I wanna say thank you. It's important to celebrate our diversity. It's important to talk about the heritage and the culture of the people, but it's also important to remember the pillars and the trailblazers that stood firm and did all of this great work to allow us to be here. And for us, it's really important. Our district serves almost 65% of the residents that are Latino, from Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico, from Ecuador, from Colombia, I mean from all, all places. And it's important for me to make sure that our office is always responding to their needs. So obviously everything we're doing is around the relief efforts after the hurricanes that have hit Puerto Rico and Mexico, and I also want to include the U.S. Virgin Islands. Sometimes we forget about St. Thomas and St. John's, and many of these places are devastated. So I ask all of you, we want to continue to be of assistance. Many of us are joining the speaker in a few weeks, and we're going to Puerto Rico in November right after the election because we want to make sure we do our parts, right? We can't allow this administration to determine the quality of life that our people receive. So we have to do our part. So I thank you for the work you're doing. I look forward to our continued partnership. After November, I will officially begin my second four-year term, and I look forward to what's in store for each and every one of us. So thank you for not only making a difference, thank you for being the difference. God bless you, and thank you so much for all of your work. Tough number. Thank you. Thank you for those inspiring words. And you, you see, you see, you see the passion. 
You see the passion. And when, when she seeks to get something done, it gets done because of that passion. And she really believes in it. So thank you so much. Um, be, before we continue, let me introduce a few people. Um, so we have with us the attorney in charge of the criminal practice, Tina Luongo. <laughs> the director of administration, Ida Ramos. <laughs> General counsel, Scott Rosenberg. Um, the Director of Communications, Pat Bath. Thank you, Pat, for arranging this evening. So we have, Carly, she has, well, I guess she has, I think you have one row or two rows? Two rows, right? You're kind of morphing into the other one. Uh, she was the attorney in charge of the JRP here in the Bronx and is going to be the attorney in charge of the juvenile rights practice for the entire city. Don Mitchell. <laughs> behind the pole, there's Peter Jones, the attorney in charge of the criminal practice. <laughs> and the director of social work for criminal justice. <laughs> I, I think Marshall Green is on vacation in Greece, maybe. Oh. <laughs> and uh, Adrian Holt has asked me to express her regrets. She, uh, she couldn't be here this evening. Uh, but she was thinking about it. <laughs> uh, so, so we're going to continue with our program this evening. Now we have three three terrific staff members who are going to speak, uh, and I guess I'll do them in alphabetical order. Okay. Uh, by last name. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the, the first speaker will be uh, Alina Aguiar. She's a social worker in the criminal defense practice here in the Bronx. And did I pronounce your name correctly, Elena? No? <laughs> what's, what's the correct pronunciation? What's the correct pronunciation? Oh, Elena Aguilar. Elena Aguilar. Yeah. Okay. First, I want to thank um, everyone for inviting me to give this speech and for everyone who came this evening. I'm a little nervous, so sorry. Um, for most of my childhood, I grew up here in the South Bronx, less than a mile away, on 170th Street Grand Concourse. In fact, I went to junior high school right here on Morris Avenue next to the Catholic school. The Bronx has always been my home. Even when I leave, I always find my way back to it. Currently, I only live a 10-minute walk away from the office. Last year, there was a request in the social work unit for a volunteer to transfer to Manhattan. I volunteered. Some thought I made the choice because I wanted to be outside of the Bronx bubble. I had to make it clear to those people that even though I was from the South Bronx, which is considered one of the poorest districts in the country, I was never in a bubble. If you go down a checklist of poverty myths, there are a lot that can be checked off based on firsthand experiences or the experiences of my neighbors, my family, and my friends. Living below the poverty line, receiving public assistance, exposure to substance abuse, mental illness, gun violence, domestic violence, broken homes, and child abuse, just to name a few. But what I can never check off is not being taught the value of education, not having strong work ethics instilled in me, or lacking respect and compassion for other people. Education was very important in my family, especially to my grandmother who came here from Puerto Rico and raised two children on her own while learning English, working two jobs, and going to school herself. If it wasn't for my grandmother, I would have not loved reading. I would have, I would have not made a promise to her at age eight I was going to go to Yale or Harvard which I ended up not going to either school, but going to, <laughs> but I went to Columbia instead, which I bet, <laughs> thank you, is, which I bet is not on the poverty myth checklist. If it wasn't for her, I would have not learned with Scrabble tiles how to finally spell my last name <laughs> when I was nearly in second grade because Aguilar was the worst to me back then, too many vowels. It also didn't help that I often had to correct people on how to say it. <laughs> My mom, who came here with my grandmother, always made sure my two younger sisters and I took advantage of all the opportunities made available to us. She made sure we knew there was life outside of the Bronx, out of New York, out of the United States. 
but she always made sure to remind my sisters and I that people would judge us, people would criticize us, people would try to bring us down just based on the color of our skin, our last names, or where we come from. When we face that type of adversity, though, to hold our head up high and continue to move forward. Along with moving forward, I learned to bring along others. I've been fortunate enough throughout my life to have people who support and encourage me. They help pick me up when I'm about to fall or completely fell down. They remind me it's always momentarily. They fight for and with me. In my opinion, that's the work we do with and for our clients. We fight for them, we support them, we help them get back up. We believe in them. Sometimes that helps them to believe in themselves. We remind the judges, the DAs, correctional officers, politicians, and everyone else involved in the legal system that our clients are more than a nice it, booking case, docket, or indictment number. Like us, he or she is a person with their own story that needs to be heard, especially during these political times when every step forward that has been made over the years, they're now trying to push us back 10. For these reasons and more, we know that our clients need us. However, I've also learned that sometimes we need them just as much as they need us. They remind us why we stand in this room and what it means to each of us personally. For me, it means helping not just my community here in the Bronx, but across the city, country, and world. Thank you. Lena, thank you so much. That was great. Sharing your experiences and talking about how to confront problems that we encounter as well as the problems that our clients encounter on a regular basis. Our, our, our next speaker uh, is, I gotta find my right sheet. Yeah. Adon Soltram. Adon, I think I got the first name right. Did I pronounce the last name right? Adon Soltram. Soltram. Oh, okay. Almost like John, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Don is a staff attorney in, in the Ottawa uh, Committee Law Office. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, before I begin, I just want to first thank um, the our union, the attorneys, uh, the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys. At Legal Aid, they've recently agreed to donate five thousand dollars for the Puerto Rico relief efforts. Um, so I want to shout them out real quick, and also, <laughs> and I also wanted to quickly thank all of the staff and all of the boroughs um, for contributing. We've been doing an internal fundraiser and donation drive for victims of the hurricane, and we've raised a lot of money. We've collected a lot of goods. It's going to get most of the goods will get shipped out next week. Um, so thank you all for that. Uh, so it's been a long time since I've given a speech like this. I think the last time was probably when I was in undergrad uh, at graduation, speaking on behalf of some of the Latinos uh, there. And I think part of the reason why I choose to be selective in terms of when I voice you know, my opinions in this kind of forum is because I want you to feel everything that I'm saying. Um, and if I'm not feeling kind of what it is I'm going to tell you, then you're not going to feel it. So I'm a little bit particular about that. Um, so I've been told that one of my strongest attributes as an advocate is that I speak from the heart without reservation. Um, and that's exactly what I plan to do here tonight. I just want to let you know that I'm speaking from a heart that's hurting. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm a New Yorican. Um, I've been blessed with two wonderful parents who have instilled in me um, cultural values and an understanding of my history and my culture. And uh, my grandfather, who's no longer with us, he passed away this year, um, he also was pivotal in instilling that in us, me and my family. He used to say things like, el que, quiere, el que no quiere a su patria, no quiere a su mamá, right? If you don't love your homeland, you don't love your mother. Um, his values and his perspective shaped the way I view the work that I do. Um, I saw the injustices that he went through, both on the island, through him secondhand, of course, but um, that he went through on the island, and I heard the stories about the things he had to deal with as a dark-skinned Puerto Rican man um, in New York, having very light Puerto Rican boys and girls. Um, so I just want to quickly take a moment to... to Thank him for, for the teachings he gave me. 
Um, so while we understand that the devastation in PR after Maria is, has been unprecedented, um, it's horrific. I think what's important to note, though, is that the response that we've gotten from the U.S. government is not unprecedented. We know exactly what this story looks like. Um, we've seen this before. The failure, the failure of the U.S. government to adequately send aid, the stigmatization, our president referring to Latinos and Latinx, Latinx folks as lazy, as freeloaders, um, this is not new. The systematic eradication of our people is not new. You need to hear me when I say that. <laughs> um, whether it was the genocide of the Tainos way back when, whether it was profiting off of the African slaves when they were brought to the island, um, whether it was the insular cases which came down from the Supreme, Supreme Court which forged the shackles of, col of colonization which is what we still suffer from today. This is our history. This is your, hi this is American history. Um, whether it was the systematic uh, sterilization of Puerto Rican women in the 50s and 60s where a third of the female population was sterilized without them knowing and without their consent because we were considered mongrels. That is our history. The nuclear weapons testing of Vieques, that is our history. So this is not new and don't let anybody tell you that it is. Um, however, the only difference between the past and what's happening now, what's going on now in this crazy time that we live in um, is that we've never had an administration that's so bold and explicit with the racism, the homophobia, the transphobia, the sexism, the attack on disabled folks. Um, and I've spent a lot of time trying to find light in the darkness because it seems most times that I can't find any. And then when I think about it, I understand that even though there's some people on the far end of the spectrum the resistors that are always going to be resistors. We might never reach them. The people in the middle, the persuadables, the apathetics, there's no way right now that they can deny what's happening. They're at a moment, we are all at a moment in our history where it's so in your face that a choice has to be made. You have a moral obligation to make a choice. And I think knowing that gives me hope because I feel like we can reach those people. I'm going to keep fighting to try to reach those people. I'm going to fight for my clients so they can flourish and that one day we can hopefully bring those people into the fold and understand. I think, as I said, we're in a pivotal moment, moment in history with regards to race equity, racial justice, um, and social movements and civil rights. To my Latino, Latinx colleagues and colleagues of color, now is the time to find your voice if you haven't found it already. We need you to speak out. We need you to be champions for our community. Every successful movement that's ever happened in this country was led by the people who were most affected. That is the way it has been and that's the way it has to be. Um, I understand, trust me, as my colleagues and anyone who knows me, I, we have conversations all the time. I know it's hard, um, especially in this climate, I know it's hard. But you need to dig deep. We need to dig deep. We need to help each other out, carry the load. If you need help carrying the load, you can holler at me, I'll help. <laughs> I'll try. Um, but we really need to do whatever we can to feed our soul because now more than ever, we have to take advantage of this leverage point in our history. To my white colleagues, while you might not be leaders of the movement necessarily, you're needed more than ever now. Your, your participation in this is crucial. We all understand that we all have privilege. I'm a cisgender, light-skinned Puerto Rican. English is my first language. Um, I'm an attorney. I am a United States citizen, even though 50% of our country doesn't know that. <laughs> and I am physically and mentally able. <laughs> I acknowledge that I have privilege. And it's important that we all understand the privilege that we have so we can fully appreciate and understand those who don't have those privileges. We need to not meet that with defensiveness or resentment or guilt, but with understanding, empathy, and compassion. Um, 
excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> um, well, I guess to close, uh, I just want to say, and this might sound redundant for a lot of my Latinos in the room, but um, we've been dreaming well before, way before there were dreamers, and we're going to continue to realize dreams well after number 45 is gone. We fought against the ills of colonial America, racist America, well before 45, and we're going to continue to fight long after he's gone. Uh, we take pride in our differences and the amazing contributions we've made, and we're going to continue to because that is what Latinx or Latinos do. That is what we do. We fight. Um, with that, I just want to let you know that I appreciate all of the work that you all do, um, and I implore you to mobilize, educate, advocate, and to take risks because that's the task of our time. Thank you. And Vida Puerto Rico Libre. Adan, thank you for reminding us of the history of the dark history of colonization. And unfortunately, there is still colonization in this country. Uh, and for those insightful remarks and words of encouragement, make all of us think about what we need to do to improve the quality of life, not only for Latinx, but everyone in this country. Uh, I'd now like to uh, invite our last speaker to come up, uh, Cassandra Tolentino, who is a, from the juvenile rights practice, social worker. You're your third year as an attorney, right? Second. Second. <laughs> I got your name right. You did. You did. You, got my, <laughs> you get full points for that. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for showing up, and thank you, thank you for the speakers, um, to Council Member Gibson, to Alina, to Adan. You have given me life, and you have reinforced why I'm here, and I'm and and why I'm so privileged. To, do, to be able to do the work that I do. Uh, so thank you. Um, it means the world to me. Um, and and Adan, there's, there's definitely hope. You know, it's, it's horrible. My heart is hurting as a Puerto Rican woman, um, as an American woman, as a woman that, um, whose parents came here from the island where my mom worked at a factory here. Um, my dad was a welder. My dad fought in, you know, a dark-skinned Puerto Rican who fought in the Korean War and experienced extreme discrimination um, because it was around the time that Lolita Lebron exercised her right to um, protest in, in, in D.C. So he bore the brunt of that um, overseas. And I grew up learning about their history, um, and I grew up learning about my history one foot here on the mainland and one foot on the island, at least through stories that they told me. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to go back to when I got the offer from Legal Aid to work at JRP. I was prepping for the bar and for a silly little graduation speech I had to give. Um, that now it seems really, really city, silly given the work that I do on a daily basis. But I got the call from Maria Garcia. And it was such a lovely conversation. And one of the things that she asked me, she was like, your last name is Tolentino. Tolentino. Um, do you know this political, the cultural leader that, that is very active in the South Bronx? And she told me a lot about him, who worked with youth. And I'm just like, actually, no, I'm sorry. Don't take the offer back. Um, <laughs> um, and, I, and, and she said, well, here's the thing. It's fine that you don't know about him. He recently passed away, but I'm so glad to be giving you this call because you know, I looked at your, your background and everything that you've done. And I think that coming from the South Bronx, I grew up 16 blocks away, uh, 145th between Willis and Third Avenue. Um, there's a lot that you can give and provide to our, to our, um, to our clients. They've provided more to me in the two years that I've been here, but that's another thing. Um, yes, I grew up on 145th. My mother was a foster parent, so we were a foster family. Oftentimes, I would come to Bronx Family Court with my mom, um, and three of my siblings are adopted through the foster care system. Uh, 
they're my siblings, they're not my adopted siblings. But that said, when I accepted the position, I called up my siblings and they were just like, yeah, we know Bronx Family Court very well. We will not be visiting you <laughs> anytime <laughs> soon for lunch, um, but we know and thank you. You know, we, we're glad that you're doing, you're doing this type of work. Um, I had no intention when I went into law school to practice in front of a judge. I did not want to be a litigator. Um, I came from an education policy and administrative background. Uh, my idea was seeing the dis constant disparity that people of color, that students of color face in education, in higher education. Um, I wanted to do policy work. And my journey took me to through clinics that led me to the possibility that I might not be so bad um, in front of a judge and advocating for our people, our black and brown people um, that are marginalized consistently and historically. And here I am. Uh, a little bit about my story. Um, we know that my parents were foster parents. We know that I came from education policy. Um, I did a lot of work in education. I did a lot of work um, with the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. It was pretty much the first job that I got after grad school um, where I learned so much about the actual policy and horrific history that the United States and the relationship that the United States had with, with the island. Um, and I incorporated that into my life. I incorporated how my parents brought me up and I incorporated the histories of the children that came through our home um, with my parents being foster parents and thinking how blessed I was that I wasn't separated from my family. And that was even as a young girl, just not understanding the full impact that the system had placed on those siblings of mine, not only the adoptive ones, but the ones that went through our home, um, not knowing that years later, organically, I'd end up here and thinking that I wouldn't want to end up here, but I'm so glad. And on a daily basis, I, I thank the opportunity that legal aid gave me to be able to advocate for our young people, um, for our babies, for our adolescents, for um, everyone that's forgotten because our, our, our kids, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't want to give this idea that Children are powerless because they ha they're so powerful in, in their capacity to heal and in, in, in their capacity to survive the experiences that they, do, that they survive, whether it's being separated unjustly from their families or whether it's healing from whatever they need to heal with and, and their families heal so that they can return to their families and, and receive stability. Um, it's amazing that I'm able to incorporate my culture and how I was brought up and the music that I listened to and the language that I was brought up in. Um, whatever I studied through the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, through Hunter College's Urban Affairs Program, through law school, and, and mix that all up in my advocacy for them. Um, because it allows me to remember that they have a history and they have a background. And I incorporate that in my conversations with them. And when I'm in front of the judge, giving them a platform and giving what they want said, said. Um, and I think that's important. And that's something that we all need to take away from on a daily basis, like our history and being open to their history. Um, it's a really hard situation that we're in now. Um, and we've already spoken, everyone's spoken very eloquently about that. Um, but I think it's hopeful that you're all in this room, that I'm here, that we're all here and we're advocating for the people that need, to, that, need that voice. Um, and again, this gives me life. And thank you. And we're all going to continue doing this. And I'm going, I'm going to tell Don, yes, like I, I could do more. I think we all can do more. I'm 
we had a conversation right before this got started, and he's just like, you can, you, you know, I need to see you like at the union, and do, I'll do it. I'll do it because absolutely we all need to do more um, because that'll help us become better, better advocates. Uh, thank you. So I think those closing remarks were very telling. You know, so many of us think that because we're at the Legal Aid Society, we're doing what needs to be done. To some degree, we are. But there's so much more that we all need to do. And we need to keep that in mind. Um, with respect to the, con I believe the contributions are, can still be made through this Friday? Yes, right? from 952. 592, and I think there, there are also uh, locations in each of the other offices, if you're from another, another office. Um, is it posted on, is it on the website, Pat, where, they, where we go? Where the contributions can be given? Is it? It is on a website, yes. Yeah. So, so, so if you're one of the other buildings, you can find out where, where, to, where to make those contributions. Uh, yes, Adon. So maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll keep the uh, keep it going rather, rather than just limit it to this, this one period of time because uh, as you said it's going to be a long time before things return to normal and even normal there is not is not great because of how this government has treated uh, Puerto Rico and particularly this this administration it's you know each day is more shocking. Mm -hmm. what we see coming out of Washington. Uh, you know, I don't think any of us have, a lot of us thought it would be bad, but I don't think any of us thought it would be this bad. Um, the man is just, I mean, he's a certifiable bigot, and, uh, and he's also deranged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. I really, th this evening was really uh, inspiring. I, we heard some great speeches. I thank uh, Council Mem Member Gibson for joining us and leading off the, the discussion and telling us why we need to keep working hard while she keeps working hard, because she's doing, she's doing it at the, at the City Council. Uh, and we've got to keep, keep supporting her. Um, so everyone have a, a great evening. Thank you for being here. I think there may be some more food outside, so if you want to get a little something to take home, you can do that.